Is it fall yet? I know for many of you fall is your very favorite season and today I have for you a polymer clay jewelry project that celebrates the warm shades and beautiful imagery of autumn. You can use the simple sculpting that I show to create tube beads like I'm going to demonstrate or you can put them on anything you like, a necklace pendant, home decorations, whatever you want to make to celebrate fall in your own way. Hi there, Sandy here. Welcome to another polymer clay jewelry video at keepsakecrafts.net. The very first thing I did for this project was I mixed up a shade of clay that I thought would be a pretty backdrop for a lot of antiquing. We're going to add all sorts of texture so this color really is kind of a backdrop for the antiquing and the metallic highlights that we'll add to it. To get my color I mixed two parts ecru, two parts gold, and one part burnt umber. Once you have your color mixed roll that out to a thin, maybe a number three or four setting, somewhere around a, a millimeter thick. I was sort of going for the look of carved stone. So what I have here are a whole bunch of embossing powders. If you've ever done scrapbooking, you probably have a bunch of these already in your stash. I wouldn't go out and buy them, especially for this. They certainly add a lot though. And I just pulled some shades that I thought would work, and surprisingly the green looks really great. It's just a bit of contrast. And I've got a, a little tool here. This is one of these Arteza ceramic sculpting tools, and it's actually kind of perfect. We're just scooping up a little bit of each of these embossing powders. And we're going to mix this into our clay for a stone-like look. Again, I'm not going to list off all of the specific colors I use because really you just find some shades. You know, I've got beige and brown. Black, I think, really gives some great contrast. And the mossy green is kind of cool, but really just pull out whatever you've got. Any kind of little speckles in there will give it the stone-like look. Then spread this as thinly as you can. Embossing powder is kind of a pain to mix in to polymer clay, so if you can kind of spread it thin and get as much of it as possible already stuck to the clay, that will help. Now I'm just going to fold my sheet in half this way, and then I'm going to fold it this way send it through my pasta machine with this fold down and this fold on the side that will minimize air bubbles and end mess. And you just keep sending it through until the powders are evenly mixed in. Once you have your embossing powders mixed in, your clay will look something like this. It'll have this speckly look, which really enhances the idea that it's stone. You'll want to roll your clay out to a medium thin setting. This is about a number four, which is maybe a little bit over a millimeter thick. You don't really need the walls of the beads to be too thick. These are ones I made earlier that I think were on the number two setting of my pasta machine. And I think they are just a little too thick. So a four seems to be pretty good. We're going to form the tube beads on a dowel. This is a quarter inch wooden dowel and I've just wrapped it with a piece of deli paper. You can use parchment paper. You can even just use plain typing paper. Do make sure that you secure the end down well. Here I've used just some scotch tape, which may stick a little to the inside of the beads, but it'll come right off. You can also, if you want to take the time, use a very thin smear of tacky glue and glue, hold it until it's glued down. You do want it glued down well. The clay will not hold it down as evidenced by these. You can see where I had wrapped some paper around and it, the, that very edge was not stuck down and it stayed stuck up. It did not, the clay being wrapped around it didn't flatten it and it kind of distorted the shape of my bead. It's got this bump so I'm not going to use these. Also I didn't really like the color. You do want to make sure that you get that edge of the paper nice and flat. Then we'll just cut a straight edge and just lift that up a bit so it'll lift. Go ahead and wrap the clay around the dowel. Just 
just like you were wrapping it around a cane. Roll it forward, make a mark, and cut just inside that mark. Roll it up and smooth away the seam. Don't be too aggressive with your tube of clay here. What you don't want to do is stretch it out so that it ends up being bigger than the dowel that it's wrapped on because what happens then is it kind of slops around and it doesn't fit on there tightly and it moves on you and it doesn't keep that nice shape. So go ahead and just smooth that seam with your fingers until it's all well blended. Now my whole thought behind these beads, like I said, was to get the look of carved stone. So I really want to add a lot of texture to this. And this is a fun tool to use. It worked perfectly. It's just the bottle brush. It came in that Arteza set of tools that I showed you a while ago. If you use the narrow end, it makes little holes which are going to look wonderful when antiqued and they're filled with paint. If you use the wider end, you end up with more of lines. So a combination of that and just cover the whole thing with a texture. If you need to afterwards, you can roll it lightly to reform the shape if it got a little distorted. We're almost ready to bake these beads, but you want to cut them apart into the lengths that you want. I like making them anywhere from half an inch to, at the most, about three quarters of an inch. What I found works best is you hold your blade right on there and then roll the tube away from you and you will be able to see this line coming up underneath in time to line your blade up with it perfectly. There. Go around one more time nice and carefully just to cut through all the way to the paper. Then decide your width and repeat till you've made all the cuts for all the beads that you want. Here's one I did earlier and baked. And these come right off and they usually fall apart. If not, they'll just break apart. If you don't like the way these edges look, you can just rub them on a bit of sandpaper. I kind of liked the way they looked, so I just left them as is. Now here's a spot where I didn't line it up properly, so I just got it even and then start it again in another spot and this I can just break off and again if you need to sand it you can do that and a little dowel like that with not even six inches I don't think of clay wrapped around it will give you plenty of beads for a bracelet now it's time to decorate our beads with some little fall motifs what I'm going to do is decorate three larger ones for my bracelet with more of the motifs and then I'm going to use smaller ones in between with just a simpler decoration. So I'm going to show you how to make a few different motifs. The first thing I'll show you is a little oak leaf. Just go ahead and roll maybe a slightly smaller than quarter inch ball of clay. Make a smooth ball, make it slightly oval, and flatten it slightly on your work surface. I often make my leaves and decorations pretty thin and delicate, but for this project I'm keeping them a little bit thicker, again going with my idea of carved stone, and also the fact that these are going to be on a bracelet, they're going to get banged around, we're going to antique them pretty aggressively, so they really need to be strong enough to hold up to all that treatment. I love my little bent needle tool for this. It just makes it so easy to get in the space. So this is how I figured out to make an oak leaf. And actually if you look it up online there are lots of different styles of oak leaves. You just press into the long edge of your oval. One, two, three. So in the center and if you need to you can flatten it out again and then one on each side. Repeat on this side. And now you have this funny looking little blob. Take a small silicone shaper 
I'll have links to these products that I'm using at my blog post. Start in the middle one and just kind of poke it in and then roll it up. Poke it in, roll it up. Poke it in, roll it up. I've found this works best if you start in the center one. If you start on the edge one, it sometimes closes up the other ones. Just like that. It's still not looking terribly like an oak leaf, but we'll get there. I'm going to make this pointy, but boy, I searched Google Images for oaks, oak leaves and acorns, and I was amazed at all the different shapes that oak leaves came in. But I kind of just made an oak leaf that looks like what I think of as an oak leaf. Actually, first I tried to make it from just my mind and what I thought it should look like, and then it didn't look right, so then I went and looked it up. And so I, actually it was just a matter of having the right number of lobes seemed to work. I'm going to put a very thin coat of TLS all over my bead. I want a very thin coat because I don't want to fill in all of that texture that I made earlier that I want the antiquing to go into. Go ahead and pick up your leaf, which does not look much like a leaf at the moment, and place it wherever you want it on your bead, and lightly tap it down. And now we'll make it look like a leaf and adhere it more firmly to our bead at the same time. Take your needle tool, go ahead and press in the center vein and then press in a angled vein from each on each side heading towards each of the lobes actually that's right i thought it looked better and going from the center out there we go if you need to you can take your needle tool and kind of refine those inner corners if they got squished out too much and there you have an oak leaf. Another thing that looks really good with this motif are just little itty bitty clay balls. Roll them really tiny and if you roll one that you think is too big it's and it can be really hard to roll these small enough so if you rolled one that you said oh that's much too big don't try to cut the ball in half just roll it into a bit of a snake and cut it into oh, two or three pieces. I ended up using about six or so for each of my beads, so it's a good idea to actually roll out a bunch ahead of time and then you can just grab them instead of having to stop and roll them for each one that you need. That gets kind of tedious. Pop those onto your bead. Make sure there's TLS under where they are. Use an eighth inch ball tool to just press. This not only adheres them better to the clay, it also, I think, I think it makes me think of an acorn cap. I don't know, something about the shape just seems more fallish. And it also gives a great place for some of that paint to stick. So there's oak leaves, little berry dotty things, and let me show you how to make an acorn. You want to roll a ball maybe slightly larger than what you used for your oak leaf. Go ahead and roll it in your fingers and try to try to kind of pinch and pull out that point. It's going to be a little exaggerated now, but that's okay. And acorns come in different shapes and sizes. There's round ones, there's long thin ones. They come in all kinds of shapes. But don't worry about that shape for now. We'll fix that in a moment. And then roll out a fairly small amount. It kind of just takes trial and error to figure out how much is the right amount for this. And flatten it into an oval. And use the handle of a tool. Here's a few different ones. This is a leather stamping set and this handle is makes a great texture. This is part of that Arteza set. This is my needle tool set, which has a texture. I'm going to use this one just to get sort of an acorn cap texture. Just like that. 
You want to wrap this around the top of your little acorn shape. Um, and wrap it around the back. You just want a light touch. And then I've got kind of this excess on the back. I'm just going to hold this sideways. Make sure i got the sharp end down. And slice. That'll give you a flat surface back here that will much better stick to your bead. Pop down your acorn. As you're fiddling with it and trying to get this shape the way you want it, that will help press it onto the bead. If you get it perfect on the tile first and then put it on your bead, you're going to have a hard time getting that shape the way you want. So I am kind of using the rubber tool to sort of give it a texture here, maybe again reminiscent of hand carved. And also you can take your, and, and this is good, hold it like this by the ends. Take your tool and you can kind of lightly re-impress your texture on the cap and that will also help press it in place. So the, the silicone tool is really great here just for cleaning it up and getting it just right. And for the stem, that's pretty simple. Just roll a little bit. I like to trim it at a jaunty angle. That's probably too big. I'll use this littler one. Smaller bit. And I'm going to pop that on there. Whoop. Whoop. Huh. Yeah, that's too big. Okay. So you can fiddle with that as much as you want, add more dots. There's one more thing I'll show you how to do, and that is a little pumpkin. And really anything that you can think of that you'd like to use as a motif, just think about how it breaks down into smaller basic shapes. I mean, a pumpkin is pretty simple. I've got an oval, but you can make your pumpkin shaped however you want. You can have the oval going the other way. I'm just going to take my needle tool and lightly draw in those curved sections. And you can make it kind of perfectly centered. I sort of didn't want to. I wanted it to look a little, I don't know, I guess off-center. Just draw those in for now. For my bracelet, I just made one pumpkin and he was kind of, he was on the center bead. So TLS. I'd recommend just covering the whole thing so you don't miss any spots. Put your pumpkin on. And again, just like with the oak leaf, now we can take our rubber shaper tool, kind of soften and deepen those lines we drew in, and at the same time, we'll be pressing it more deeply, more firmly onto your bead. And I kind of like with the acorn, sort of, oops. Yeah, and that's another reason, a thin layer of liquid clay, so it doesn't slide around so much. Kind of went over it like this. To, it sort of adds to that hand-carved look. You add a stem the same way as we did on the acorn. Now for the smaller accent beads, all I added was some curly cues and dots, just to keep it simple so they had decoration, but it wasn't quite so much as the acorns and pumpkins and leaves. Now it can be very tricky to roll clay out this thin and make it even and, and have it not break on you. So what I like to do is I'll roll it out as far as I can with my fingers. Then take an acrylic block like that's used for in scrapbooking and rubber stamping and just use that. You can kind of just keep rolling, have very light pressure. And you can kind of pull and stretch and stroke and keep rolling until that's as thin as you need it to be. 
If you want, you can actually start making your curly cues right on your tile. If you have a nice long piece, it may be easier than doing it on the bead. But it's also harder to gauge the spacing if you do it on the tile. So you might want to try it both ways. I like having that long piece, it just kind of helps me. Okay. Oh! Look what I just did. <laughs> well, actually, it's already kind of programmed in there, so maybe that'll work. Oh my goodness. Okay. So that's one way. <laughs> Make the loops and then just pick it up and lay it on the bead. And actually I did that on the other ones that I'll show you in a minute. But you can also do it like this. Pick, just hold your bead by the sides and pick it up and position them. The rubber shaper really is your friend here because you can move those, put it just where you want it to be without marring. Do make sure you tap those down as firmly as you dare. You don't want to flatten your little vines, but tap them down. Make sure that they are going to be well adhered to your bead because these are pretty delicate, so you really want them stuck on there. Right, I'm just going to stop here for the moment just to get the idea. And then just a few little dots. And the little dots are kind of fun because you can... Oh, these little dots just love me. My hands must be sticky. You can kind of use them to add even a bit more curve and shape to your vines. So that's what I did with just the accent beads. Then you can just place them like this on a tile and bake them and we'll be ready to antique. So here are the beads I made out of the oven. I'm not sure if I'm going to use five or seven in my bracelet, but I made these four little spacers just like I showed you with swirls and dots. So they're just a little simpler than having the bigger kind of chunky motifs on all of them. I think they're really cute just as they are, so I think they're going to be great once I get some antiquing on them. Acorns, the pumpkin, I put some little swirly vines around the pumpkin. I'm really pleased with how these look. This is 6mm leather cord from Endless Leather. I'll have a link to them and actually looking at it I probably could have used thicker cord. And what I did here was glued in a copper end cap with some two-part epoxy. You just mix equal parts of each. You only need a little tiny bit and then apply it. So I glued in one end because it's kind of tricky to figure out the size of this. So it's helpful to have one end glued in and then I added a toggle clasp to the other one. And this way I can actually more accurately figure just how long I want my bracelet to be. I should probably take this one off. Don't you love swirly lentil beads? This, these were from a class that I did at Craft Art EDU, which sadly is no longer, that website is no longer in existence, but I am planning at some point to take these classes and make them PDF classes in my Etsy shop. That will be a little while, maybe by the end of the year. If you signed up for my newsletter, I will let you know when new classes are available in my Etsy shop. I'm kind of taking all of my old things from Polymer Cafe, those are all on there, and then Craft Art EDU. And once that's done, then maybe I'll start making new ones. We'll see. So there, that's kind of where I would wear it. And you definitely want to take into account that these beads are pretty chunky, so the bracelet will have to be a little bit longer. So I know the cord's going to go into that point on the cap. So um, right about there, and I'm just going to back it off like maybe an eighth of an inch and cut that. 
And once we have the beads all finished and strung, then we can just glue the other cap in. And I think these caps came from Art Beads. I'll have links at my blog post. If you're ever looking for the things that I use in a video, I always write a blog post and there's always a link up here or in the description box to that blog post where I have more information, supply lists, product links. I always write the blog post after I make the video and I usually think of other things after. I'll think of other ways you can use the technique or that ways I could have improved it. So I just have here some heavy body acrylic. I really like this transparent raw umber for antiquing. But use whatever paint you have. You could use black, you could use brown. And I'm going to be really aggressive here. I want to get that paint into all that texture that we made, the texture that we made on the base bead and all the little nooks and crannies. Uh, in the loops and in like underneath these bits, in the veins of the leaves and those little dots that we made. So I'm using kind of an old messy brush and really scrubbing, kind of looking at it from several angles. And you just antique all of <laughs> That one's eager to be antiqued. <laughs> oh yeah, and the acorn cap texture. Get it thoroughly coated and then let the beads sit just until the paint stops being shiny. So it's dried that much. That way when you wipe it off, you won't be removing more than you want to. So I don't like to let it dry 100% because sometimes then you have to scrub too hard to take off the paint but I don't want to start taking off the paint while it's still wet because then you take off too much. So it's kind of a balancing act. That's one reason I like the heavy body paint because it dries a bit more quickly. It has less water in it. So my beads have just started to lose their shininess so I'm going to go ahead and remove the paint. You can use all sorts of things. You could use a paper towel that you've wet and then wrung out really well, wrung out as much water as you can. This is a baby wipe that I've wrung out as much of the water as I can. You could use a microfiber cloth. Those are great, especially if you have something that has a bit of uh, texture, like a rough texture, like tree bark or something. A microfiber cloth that doesn't have loops is great because a paper product may shred and tear in the rough texture and leave bits behind, which is kind of a pain to dig out. So the microfiber cloth won't do that. Oh, isn't that nice? I'm really pleased with how these are looking. You'll want to keep changing to a clean area because if, you, if I keep wiping with this part, I'm just going to keep wiping the paint back on. So you have to just keep moving to a clean area. And I'm not going to take off too much paint. I mean, I want, I don't want it to look, I don't know. I just like the look with a fair amount of paint left on here, not too cleaned up. And I think all that texture that I added to the background bead really paid off. Oh, that looks great. So you just wipe off all of your beads to the point you want them to be and let them dry. So many of you have told me that you have learned a lot from my videos and that you just really enjoy them and my style of teaching and that just thrills me to pieces because I love creating things and I love teaching. And if you'd like to get more of my videos, my patrons can get up to two bonus tutorials a month. I also have, as I mentioned earlier, a few PDF tutorials if you like fairy gardens and sculpting in miniature. Right now I have I think nine fairy garden tutorials. They're downloadable PDFs so you can go purchase it now and download it and have it available right away to uh, to create with. I have those on my Etsy shop and I'm also planning on adding more in the near future as I mentioned. Okay so you just go ahead and do that with all of your pieces. 
So here they are after as much of the paint as I want to remove is removed and you can leave them like this and let them dry, string them and finish your bracelet. But I thought I wanted to add a little something more. What I have here are some vintage patinas. I have rose gold and antique copper and I just dry brushed some on and this is the test I did earlier. This is rose gold, this is antique copper. The difference is pretty subtle, especially on a project like this, on this color, but I think I like the rose gold better, so I'll show you how I did that. Make sure you shake these up well. There's a ball in there that you can hear. Make sure that's flowing freely. This is a great trick I learned from Christy Friesen. When you want to dry brush with something, put your paint on a piece of paper. This is just a scrap of cardstock I dug from my trash can and kind of rub your brush on the paper and the paper will absorb the water and that way you'll be able to dry brush. I'm using again an old kind of messy brush. I didn't want it to be too full because I didn't want to be adding a heavy amount. Just little touches. So I'm not trying to go over the entire thing. I thought it might be really nice to finish the edges a little bit more. Again, not like a thorough coat, but just a little bit. So I like that. It just adds something, and I think it'll kind of go with the metal in the findings. So once you have your beads all antiqued, painted, touched up, however you like, then you go ahead and slide them on your cord in whatever order you want. Make sure you're happy with it because then the next step is to glue in the other end with two-part epoxy. So I hope you enjoyed this video and if you would like to get more videos from me every month take a peek at my Patreon page and don't forget there are links to supplies and materials which you can find at my blog post which is linked in the description box and in the upper right of this video. Happy creating. Bye-bye.